Okay, so we dealt with terms last chapter. This chapter, we're gonna start putting those terms together into cohesive units of meaning, right? Go from terms to propositions. And then we're gonna deal specifically with atomic propositions. Uh, start with the building blocks of more complex propositions. Uh, and to really understand you know, how, how even to get to complex propositions, we're gonna look at how these terms are related to each other. We're talking about truth relations. Um, the impact that the truth value that one proposition has on another. And then to wrap it all up, we're gonna take a look at some exercises. So as I mentioned, this chapter we're dealing with atomic propositions. Now a proposition, uh, like I said, is something that's either true or false, right? And we express these using sentences. Now last chapter, we dealt with terms. Now terms are not what are true or false. Terms either define or fail to define. Um, propositions are composed of terms, but they themselves are not the same thing as terms. So I, I can have a term, right, uh, tree, tree, another term, tall, and these have definitions, these have meanings. It isn't until I combine them that I get a proposition, and specifically an atomic proposition. Uh, the tree is tall. The tree is tall. So an atomic proposition is composed of a subject and a predicate. In this case, the tree, the subject, what's being described, and the predicate, tall, was doing the describing. So we got an atomic proposition. Uh, this is uh, a statement that's either true or false. Right? Propositions are statements that are true or false. Now, you know, we're talking about atomic propositions. Well, they're, they're not atomic in the sense that they're used in fission, right? In nuclear fission, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, the word atom that we use in English is derived from a Greek word, atomos. And that's, this in itself, it means indivisible. And this word itself, atomos, is, is a, a combination of two other words in Greek, a, meaning not, and I think it's pronounced timnin or tiemnin, something like that, right? uh, in Greek meaning to cut. So in Greek, literally not to cut, right? indivisible, not to cut. So these propositions are atomic in this sense. You can't break them apart anymore and still have a proposition. I could simply say the tree. Right, but I haven't actually uttered a proposition. I haven't even uttered a sentence, at least not a complete one. Uh, I can say, is tall. All right. When you separate either the subject or the predicate, you no longer have a proposition. I can still break apart the proposition, but it's atomic in the sense that it is no longer a proposition. So, uh, what a good chance, so, you know, that, that's one way to understand atomic propositions. That's what they are. It's a subject and a predicate. And I, I want to be careful to contrast this to complex propositions. Now, complex propositions are still propositions. They're things that are true or false, right? So here's an atomic proposition. The tree is tall, and there's another one. The sky is cloudy. Okay. Well, I, I can combine these two propositions to form, uh, these two atomic propositions to form a complex proposition. Okay. The tree is tall and the sky is cloudy. Right, there's a complex proposition. It is composed of two atomic propositions. Now, a complex proposition could be broken apart and you still have a proposition. Right? So, the tree, so the two parts of a complex proposition, the tree is tall, that's one part. The other part, the sky is cloudy. Right? I take out the tree is tall from the complex proposition. I still have a proposition. Right? Complex propositions are composed of atomic propositions, or you know, even smaller, <laughs> complex propositions. But an atomic proposition, you can't break that apart even further. And this is, the atomic proposition is, is the basic unit of truth, right? This is the basic unit of, at least what we can express, uh, how we can express the truth. When I say the tree, I haven't said anything is true or false. I'm just, it's in the definite article and a subject, right? that's it. Uh, it isn't until I say the tree is tall that I've uttered a proposition. So I want to 
offer kind of a quick word of warning. Uh, atomic propositions need not be short. <laughs> so I just used the tree is tall as an example. Well, that, that's, a, that's a very short sentence. It's not a long, complicated sentence. But atomic propositions can be long and complicated. All right, so say something like, uh, the first form of government that existed immediately after the American Revolutionary War differed in important respects from our current form of government. That's a long-ish sentence. At least it's longer than uh, the tree is tall. Now, believe it or not, that's an atomic proposition. It's got a lot of modifiers in it. It's kind of a complex description of a subject and a predicate, but that's an atomic proposition. So, for just to kind of spell it out, uh, the first form of government that existed immediately after the American Revolutionary War, that's not a complete sentence. That is not something that's either true or false. And in, in this case, it's the subject. The uh, phrase, right, uh, differed in important respects from our current system of government. That is also not a complete sentence. That's a phrase. Uh, it isn't until you put those together that you actually have an atomic proposition. Okay, so first warning, atomic propositions are not always short. <laughs> they can be long and an atomic proposition. Uh, second warning, not just any sentence is a proposition. There are lots of sentences that are not propositions. So uh, the type of sentence that expresses a proposition is called a declarative, right? It's something that's either true or false. Other kinds of sentences would be something like imperative, right? Look at the tree, look at the tree, right? Imperative, that's a command. That's a command. You, the, the idea is that's not something that's true or false. Look at the tree is not true or false. That's either something that you follow or don't follow. An interrogative is a question. Uh, it's a request for information. So what color is the tree? That is also not something that's true or false, right? It's requesting something that's true or false, but uh, it's not itself true or false. And then you have exclamations, right? Exclamations. These are expressions of you know, emotional um, approval or disapproval or maybe pain or sadness or something like that. So something like, oh, what a beautiful tree. Right? That's an exclamation. That's not something that's true or false. So two warnings. First, atomic propositions need not be short. And second, not just any sentence is an atomic proposition. So this brings us to a uh, uh, kind of a distinction I want to make between assertions and denials. Um, this is not, you know, <laughs> the most revelatory distinction in the world. It's probably pretty common sense. But the idea, you know, when I talk about assertions, I'm going to talk about the claim that a proposition is true, be it atomic or complex. We'll get into complex propositions more in, in later chapters, later videos. Uh, but for now, when we deal with assertion, just saying that a proposition is true. And in the case of an atomic proposition, we're saying that the subject is predicated, right? The subject is so predicated. So if I say, you know, if I assert that the tree is tall, I'm saying the tree is tall. <laughs> uh, with a denial, we're saying that the subject is not predicated. We're dealing with an atomic proposition, the subject is not predicated. So it is false that the tree is a mammal, right? There's a denial. Uh, there's a denial that the tree is a mammal. Okay. There's other ways to express it. Not only is it false, it is false that the tree is a mammal, but uh, the tree is non-mammalian. <laughs> uh, the tree is not a mammal. These are all, the, all three of these are predicates, pretty much expressing the same thing. Right? A tree is not a mammal. Uh, so an assertion is the claim that a proposition is true. A denial is the claim that a proposition is false. Which brings us to another uh, concept that I'm going to use this phrase pretty often, the truth value of a proposition. And truth value probably sounds more complicated than it is, but all, all I mean by the truth value is uh, whether the proposition is true or false. So the proposition, uh, the tree is tall, has a truth value of true. And the proposition, the tree is a mammal, has a truth value of false. Again, not, not earth shattering revelations, but it's helpful to explain the lingo. Um, so we got assertions, denials, and truth value. Now, kind of a, a, a little bit of a word of warning. Right? 
Logicians are not primarily interested with whether a particular proposition is true or false. Uh, in fact, most of the time, uh, logicians are worried about the relationship between these propositions, uh, which will, you know, the relationship will, between the propositions will determine whether further propositions are true or false. True. Uh, but most of our work is not investigating the truth value of any particular proposition. Most of our work is looking at the truth relationships between propositions and then what that can do or what it can help us do with thought. So I very briefly mentioned truth relation. Some propositions have an impact on other propositions. Specifically, the truth value of one proposition can impact the truth value of another proposition, or a second proposition. So we have a proposition. Uh, see, this, this tree is a plant. This tree is a plant. Well, that has an impact on another proposition. Uh, this tree is a living organism. If it's true that this tree is a plant, it's also true that this tree is a living organism. So the truth value of the first has an impact on the truth value of the second proposition. Uh, it's not just true to true, right? Uh, it's true that this tree is a plant, so it's false that this tree is a mammal. If it's true that this tree is a plant, it's false that this tree is a mammal. So it's true to false. Now, I mentioned truth values. So we're only dealing with two kinds of truth values, true and false. We're not dealing with mostly true or kind of true or sort of false, right? These are the only two truth values, true and false in this course. So if we're dealing with one relationship, you know, one proposition to a second, uh, and that first proposition has two possible truth values, right? It's either true or false and we do the relationship to a second, and that second proposition has two, possibi two possible truth values, true or false, then we have four kinds, we have four, not four kinds, but we have four simple truth relations. Four simple truth relations. Now, to be clear, right, they're not simple in the sense that they're easy to understand, although they might be, they might be. Uh, si they're simple in a different sense. So the word simple, we get from Latin means simplus, simplus. And this word was used to refer to uh, certain kinds of medicines that only had one plant, or it just really meant having one part. So uh, this is the sense in which these truth relations are simple, that the, they, only, they are their own part, right? They, they're not broken down any further into any smaller truth relations, right? These, these first four ones are the simple ones. There are other truth relations, there are complex ones, and they're built out of the simple truth relations. But these four are uh, the simple ones. So think of a Lego, right? A Lego, a single Lego is simple. Okay? It's, it's that one part. A Lego model, when you put it together, that's complex. Right? But the Lego itself is simple. And it's in this sense that we have these four simple truth relations. And again, we have four possibilities, right? Either the first proposition is true or the second proposition is false. And so we have, uh, uh, if the first proposition is true, then either it means that the second one is true or it means the second one is false. Or if the first proposition is false, then either that means that the second proposition is true or the second proposition is false. Or in short, true makes true is one, true makes false is the second, false makes true is the third, and false makes false is the fourth. We'll look at those in a little bit more detail. Okay, let's start with those truth relations that begin uh, with the proposition, the first proposition being true. Yeah. So first one is uh, true makes true, right? This is sufficiency, probably familiar with sufficiency. <laughs> um, 
So the, what this means is the truth of the first proposition means that the second proposition is also true. Okay, so this, org, this organism is a tree. This organism is a tree. Well, if that one's true, that is sufficient for another proposition. Namely, this organism is a plant. This organism is a plant. Uh, if this organism is a tree is true, then it's also true that this organism is a plant. Suppose we have another proposition. Uh, my pet is a dog. My pet is a dog. Uh, if that is true, it's sufficient for a second proposition, namely, my pet is a mammal. So my pet is a dog is sufficient for my pet is a mammal. So I have a couple of words of warning, right? Um, the first warning is this. Uh, sufficiency does not necessarily run in both directions. Okay? That this organism is a tree uh, is sufficient for this organism as a plant, but that an organism as a plant is not sufficient that an organism is a tree. Uh, it, it, there are sometimes sufficiency does run in both directions, but we'll you know we'll talk about that later in, in other chapters. It can run in both directions, but it doesn't necessarily run in both directions. Okay? So we could have a proposition. Uh, today is Monday, and that is sufficient for tomorrow is Tuesday. Well, by the way, tomorrow is Tuesday is sufficient for today is Monday. It can run in both directions, but it doesn't necessarily run in both directions. Now, that's the first word of warning. Just because, uh, just because one proposition is sufficient for the second does not necessitate that the second is sufficient for the first. It can be, but it doesn't necessitate. Second word of warning. All sufficiency claims that if the first proposition is true, then the second is also true. Sufficiency does not claim that the first proposition is true. So we have another... Uh, so, so, for example, let's try another one. Uh, my, my pet is a cat. If that's true, it's sufficient for my pet is a mammal. Now, my pet, in fact, my pet is not a cat. My pet is not a cat. But the truth relationship still stands between those two propositions. All sufficiency claims is if the, the, if the first proposition is true, the second proposition is also true. It makes no claim as to whether the first or the second proposition is in fact true. Okay. So that, that's sufficiency. True makes true. Okay. Uh, sufficiency doesn't necessarily run in both directions, but it can. And uh, sufficiency does not claim that the first, pro first proposition is in fact true. All right, let's look at another proposition. Let's look at another truth relation beginning with the first proposition being true. So we looked at true makes true, not sufficiency. Let's look at true makes false, right? The truth of one proposition means another is false. Okay, a second is false. So um, this is called contrary or contrariety. Okay? So this organism is a tree. You know, if that's true, it's contrary to another proposition, namely, uh, this organism is a dog. <laughs> uh, the first proposition is contrary to the second. If it's true, the second is false. Okay. Uh, no, if it's true that that organism is a tree, then it's false that the organism is a dog. Okay. So a couple of words of warning about uh, contrary. Okay. Um, as with... Uh, sufficiency, we're not necessarily claiming that the first proposition is true. So, um, you know, you think about, you know, actually what's kind of related to that is, by the way, it's possible that both are false, right? So let's take a proposition. My pet is a cat. That is contrary to uh, my, uh, uh, my pet is a tree. Right? My pet is a cat, and that's contrary to my pet is a tree. Now, as with sufficiency, nobody's, it isn't necessarily the case that the first proposition is in fact true, because as I mentioned, it's false my pet is a cat. 
Nevertheless, it's still contrary to the second proposition by Pettus a tree. Now, having said that, you know, when we're talking about contra contrary, all that's being claimed is if the first proposition is true, then the second is false. By the way, it's possible that both are false. This is this, you know, another word of warning, right? So I guess we're on third word of warning. That's the first word of warning. Um, uh, or second word. Anyway, first, you know, first word of warning. It need not be that it's not necessarily the case. Of the first proposition is true. Second word of warning. So I guess second word of warning. It's possible that both are false. Right? Uh, my pet is a cat. Is contrary to my pet is a tree, and both are false because my pet is neither a tree nor a cat. Here's the third word of warning. <laughs> the third word of warning. Um, sufficiency runs only. Or, no, uh, sorry. It, uh, can run, excuse me, sufficiency runs in one direction, can run both, but not necessarily. Okay. Contrary, necess it runs in both directions. If one proposition is contrary to a second, the second is also contrary to the first. All right. So uh, this organism is a tree, is contrary to this organism is a dog, and this organism is a dog, is contrary to this organism is a tree. Okay. So with sufficiency, it can run both directions, but it doesn't necessarily run both directions. Contrary, it runs both directions <laughs> all the time. So the last two truth relations we looked at started with the first proposition being true. The second two truth, truth relations we're going to look at start with the first proposition as false. So uh, let's try let's do it with this one. False makes true. Right, so the error of the first proposition means that the second proposition is true. This is called subcontrary. Subcontrary. Uh, some really good examples of subcontrary relationships are things like explanations. So we have a certain phenomena, and you know, given that phenomena, there's a couple of different things are possible, right? This is the way of talking about it. So maybe a really ready example for something like this would be uh, when you're logging into, say, your account at school, and you get that error message, and the error message says either you uh, either the username is incorrect or the uh, password is incorrect. Okay. So, uh, well, it, this is these are subcontrary relationships or subcontrary propositions. Right? Uh, your username is incorrect. It, you know, suppose you like you double check, right? You look at the little field, you see your username, and lo and behold, it's all typed in correctly. <laughs> uh, well, then it's false that your username is incorrect. So, it must be it must be the case that your password is incorrect. So the, these two propositions are subcontrary. The error of the first means that the second is true. So a couple of words of warning. Uh, as before, with sufficiency and, and contra, contrariety, j yeah, this is just the truth relation. I mean, this is just the truth relation. And the truth relation says if the first is f uh, false, then the second is true. But it doesn't necessitate that the first is in fact false. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't mean that the first is in fact false. Uh, it, you know, it could be that you entered your username incorrectly, right? Um, but there still would be a truth relationship between your username is, is incorrect and your uh, password is incorrect. Uh, so that's the first word of warning. It doesn't necessitate that the first proposition is, in fact, false. Second word of warning, it's possible that both propositions are true, right? So... With subcontrary relationships, you know, with contrary, it was possible that both are false, right? Contrary means that the first is true, the second is false, but both could be false. This one for subcontrary says it, they both can be true. Okay? So, suppose you you type it in that first time you get the error message, and you look at your your name in the in the field, it's like, oh, I did get my username incorrect. Well, it's also still possible that you typed in the wrong password too, right? Th th this can't happen. So that's the second word of warning. It's possible that both are in fact false. Uh, uh, sorry, both are, are uh, in fact true. It's possible both are in fact true. Uh, third word of warning. 
uh, you know, contrary relationships run both directions, always and everywhere. So do subcontrary relationships. If the first proposition is subcontrary to the second, the second is subcontrary to the first. Okay. So that's false makes true. That's subcontrary. Last one is false makes false. This is necessary. Necessity. False makes false. So uh, let's try a tree again, right? Say that organism is a, is a mammal. That organism is a mammal. Well, if that's false, in fact it is, right? If it's false, then it's also false that that organism is a dog. It's false that the organism is a mammal, so it's false that the organism is a dog. Um, the first proposition, if the first proposition is false, the second proposition is also false. That means that the first is necessary for the second. You take a look at that you know, over here again, right? You say this organism is a plant. If that's false, it's also false that that organism is a tree. Okay, so that's false makes false. Ne necessity, false makes false. So again, some words of warning here. <laughs> uh, as we saw, right, uh, this is just the truth relationship. If one proposition is ne necessary for a second, all it's saying is if the first is false and the second is also false, that doesn't mean the first is in fact false. We're just looking at the truth relationship between the two propositions. That's the first word of warning. Second word of warning, like sufficiency, necessity can run in two directions, but it doesn't but it doesn't always run in two directions. It can, but it doesn't always. So because a proposition is a first proposition is necessary for a second, it doesn't mean the second is also necessary for the first. It can, but it doesn't mean that. So, you know, thinking about our Monday and Tuesday example, right? Um, you know, today is Monday is necessary for tomorrow is Tuesday. If it's false that today is Monday, it's also false that tomorrow is Tuesday. By the way, if it's false that tomorrow is Tuesday, it's also false that today is Monday. Necessity can run in both directions, but it doesn't necessarily run in both directions, right? So, um, you know, it said this organism is a plant, is necessary for this organism is a tree. If it's false, this organism plant, it's false, this organism is a tree. But it, the reverse doesn't run the, the other direction, right? It, it, if it's false that an organism is a plant, that doesn't mean it's false that the organism, excuse me, if it's false that the organism is a tree, that doesn't mean that it's false that the organism is a plant, right? Because there's plenty of plants out here that are not trees. So first word of warning, sufficient just says, if the first is false and the second is false, but it doesn't mean that the first is false. Second word of warning, necessity can run in both directions, but it doesn't always run in both directions. Okay, so just quick summary of the truth relations, right? <laughs> you got true makes true, true makes false, false makes true, false makes false. True makes true, that's sufficiency. True makes false, that's contrary. False makes true, that's subcontrary. False makes false, that's necessary. With all of them, right, with sufficiency and contrary, it's just the relationship. But just because one proposition, first proposition is sufficient for a second doesn't mean that the first, that the first proposition is true, just that the relationship stands. Same thing with contrary, and with subcontrary and necess necessity, you know, they both start with the assumption that the first proposition is false, but it doesn't necessarily mean the first proposition is false, right? Uh, the it, the relationships just deal with the relationship, not whether the first proposition is in fact true or false. Uh, with sufficiency and necessity. It can run in, the relationship can run in both directions, but doesn't, doesn't always run in both directions. Right? It can, but it doesn't always. With <clears throat> contrary and subcontrary, that relationship always runs both directions. If the first is contrary to the second, the second is contrary to the first. If the first is subcontrary to the second, the second is subcontrary to the first. Okay. And then finally, uh, right, uh, contrary, it's possible both are false. It's possible both are false. All contrary says, is really saying is, at least one of these is false, and maybe both. Not always, but maybe. 
and subcontrary, at least one of these is true. And maybe both. Not always, but maybe. So that's a quick summary, right? Quick sum up of the four simple truth relations. Now, I want to mention one other thing, and that's irrelevant, right? Irrelevancy. <laughs> Uh, irrelevant isn't really a relationship, it's the denial that there is a relationship, but we're fond of saying, well, that first proposition is irrelevant to the second. Right? It's not really a relationship, just the denial that there is one. All right, so, you know, this happens, right? This organism is a tree. This organism is a tree. That, you know, assume it's true. That has no truth, that has no impact on the truth value of the sky is blue. It doesn't. Um, it could be that the sky is cloudy. Right? It could be that uh, it's dark outside, yeah, so the sky wouldn't be blue at all, right? It'd be pitch black. Uh, there's all kinds of ways the sky could be, that has no, but that's not impacted at all by whether this organism is uh, a tree. Uh, so there are irrelevancies between propositions. And the way you discover that is like, okay, assume, right? assume the first proposition is true, and does it have an impact on the truth value of the second? If it doesn't, move on to the false. Assume the proposition is false. Does that have an impact on the truth value of the second? If it doesn't have an impact either way, the first is irrelevant to the second. First is irrelevant to the second. Okay. Now, this is important because um, you know, it's important not only to be able to understand which truth relation exists between propositions, but whether a truth relation exists between propositions. If a tr truth relationship doesn't exist, uh, probably can't make an inference from the first to the second. <laughs> right? Okay. So we've got atomic propositions. We double that. We've got truth relations between atomic propositions. Now let's look at some exercises dealing with these kinds of propositions. So let's take a look at some different kinds of exercises for uh, atomic propositions and truth relations. The first set of problems that you're going to attempt uh, is to test your ability to spot an atomic proposition versus <clears throat> some other kind of sentence. Right? So, uh, you know, this is going to have basically two tests, right? <laughs> Trying to figure out whether you can spot an atomic proposition uh, versus, uh, say, an interrogative or an imperative or an exclamation. Right? These are different kinds of sentences, or even just sentence fragments, if, if you even have a sentence or you know, something that is even a proposition. Uh, and also, if it is a proposition, is it a complex proposition or an atomic proposition? So this kind of goes through two tests, right? <laughs> so the first test is uh, whether you're even dealing uh, uh, with a proposition. Right? So look at the sentence. You know, is it imperative? Does it make a command? Is it a, uh, a interrogative? Does it ask a question? Is it exclamation? Is it just, you know, emotional response? Or is it something that's true or false, right? Is it something that's true or false? So that's the first test. Second test, if, it's that, if it is a sentence that gives you something that's true or false, is it atomic, right? Is it composed of a single subject and a single predicate, or is it somehow two subjects and two predicates, or at least two subjects and two predicates? Okay, so let's take a look at uh, an example here first. Okay, so we have, so the question, right? Which of the following is an atomic proposition? Well, look at the first one here. Right? Cats are mammals or cats are not mammals. Okay, uh, is this an imperative? Right? Is it commanding cats to be mammals? No, it's not, right? Uh, is it an interrogative? Is it asking whether the cats are mammals or cats are not? Well, it doesn't have a question mark, right? So it's not a question mark. So it's not an interrogative. Is it an exclamation like, yay, cats are mammals or cats? No, it's not doing that either, right? Yeah, this is indeed a proposition. This is a sentence that tells us something that's either true or false. Okay. Now the question is, is it a complex sentence? Or a complex proposition, I should say. Is it a complex proposition? Um, well, how many subjects do we have? Well, we have cats, right? I mean, cats is mentioned twice, but it's, you know, that, that's the subject. And, and, you know, are mammals and are not mammals, well, those are also two different uh, subjects. So, you know, what I'm saying here is we can break apart this proposition. We got cats are mammals, the first part of the cats are mammals. Well, that's that's a proposition, and cats are not mammals. That's also a proposition. Okay. So this is complex. This is composed of two atomic propositions, and the two atomic propositions, by the way, are cats are uh, cats are mammals, and the second one is cats are not mammals. 
but we're looking for an atomic a you know which sentence is the atomic proposition well this one's complex so it's not going to do it second one salty ocean you know this is at best either a subject or a predicate but it's not both a subject and a predicate i mean salty sort of modifies ocean so you know it's maybe an adverb but this in itself doesn't say something that's true or false right and it's not imperative it's not anything else like that right this isn't even a, a proposition and frankly <clears throat> uh, it's probably a, a sentence fragment so it's not, you know, not even a complete thought third option none are atomic so what, what's getting at here is none of the options are atomic well we haven't gone through all of them so selecting this one would be a little uh, uh, you know a little quick at this point so <laughs> let's look at the last one the Atlantic Ocean is east of the continental United States okay now that's a long sentence yeah but that doesn't mean it's not a, an atomic proposition Right. All that we need for an atomic proposition, all that means is that there's a single subject and a single predicate. Well, um, the Atlantic Ocean, that's the subject. Right? And you have the predicate, you know, is, right, is east of the continental United States of America. That's the predicate. Right? So this sentence, even though it's long, right, even though it's long, this is an atomic proposition. That's the one. All right, let's uh, try uh, another kind of problem. So this one... Right, we're given uh, um, given two propositions, first and the second, and the question is, what is the truth relation from the first to the second? Okay. So, um, probably the you know the, the way to think through this problem is to start with the first proposition and then assume it's true. And if it's true, uh, is the second proposition impacted? Is the truth value of the second proposition impacted? So, if we assume it's true, is the second proposition true? But if so then it's sufficient. Or, or if, it, if it's the first is true, is the second false? You know, so it's contrary. If you assume it's true and you don't find an impact, then try assuming it's false. And assuming it's false, right? Uh, if the first one's false, is the second one true? In which case it's subcontrary. And, or or you know, if, if you assume the first one's false and you find out the, the second one is false, well, then it's necessary. Uh, and, you know, if you assume it's true and there's no impact, you assume it's false and there's no impact, then you finally can conclude that it's irrelevant. But I wouldn't conclude it's irrelevant until you go through all that. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this, right? Some dogs are mammals. Let's assume it's true. If it's true that some dogs are mammals, <clears throat> is it true that all dogs are mammals? Well, I mean, no, it's in fact true that all dogs are mammals, but not in virtue of it being true that some dogs are mammals. After all, it's true that some dogs are brown, but it doesn't follow from that that all dogs are brown, right? Dogs come in a variety of colors. So the truth of the first does not mean that the second is also true. So this it's not sufficient. Well, is it false then that some dogs are mammals? Well, no. <laughs> right? If some dogs are mammals, it's it's you know can't be false that you know all dogs or it's not, all dogs are mammals. Or excuse me, it can't be false. Uh, it's not necessarily false that all dogs are mammals. Um, yeah. So it doesn't make doesn't make the second proposition false, right? Again, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, anyway, leave, leave me that aside. Um, so you know, we didn't have any luck going from, you know, starting the, from the assumption that the first one's true. Right? Well, let's assume it's false. Let's say it's false that some dogs are mammals. Is it then true that all dogs are mammals? Well, I mean, again, not from the first one. Right. I don't know from the assumption that the first one's false. So, for instance, we can assume that some that it's false that some dogs are what bright yellow. Right. We assume some dogs are bright yellow. We say that's false. What well, does it follow then that all dogs uh, that is true that all dogs are bright yellow? Well, no. Right. It doesn't follow from that. So, um, from the assumption that it's false that some dogs are mammals, right, it doesn't follow that it's true that all dogs are mammals. Well, uh, what about if we assume it, it's false that all dogs are mammals, is it then uh, false that all dogs are mammals? Well, yeah. Right? <laughs> if it's false that some dogs are mammals, well, then it is not the case that, you know, at least some of the dogs are not going to be mammals. Well, that's not the case that, that all dogs are mammals. So, you know, again, right, uh, if we say it's false that all dogs are, that, that some dogs are bright yellow, well, that's going to be false that all dogs are bright yellow. So, uh, the first one is false. If we assume the first one's false, well, then the second one right, is also false. That makes this necessary. 
right? That makes this relationship necessary. The first one is necessary for the second. Okay. Last kind of problem. Whereas, you know, the problem we just looked at, we are given two propositions and we're trying to find the truth relationship from the first to the second. This one, we're given a single proposition and we're asked to find uh, which, uh, uh, you know, we say we, we have this proposition, well, which one is, in this case, is sufficient, right? Which one is sufficient? As, uh, as uh, this, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, we have this proposition, which prop for which proposition is this one sufficient? So we're supposed to go from the first with the truth relation to find another proposition. Okay. Now it could be sufficient, could be contrary, subcontrary, necessary, right? Whatever. But in this case, right, we have no dogs are brown. We're asking you know, the given pro proposition below is sufficient for which of the following? Okay. So uh, on the uh, so the way to do this, you kind of have to test them, right? We, we can't just sit here and start conceiving of all propositions that are true because it's true that no dogs are brown. Um, there's literally an infinite number, so I kind of to test the, the propositions. So if it's true that no dogs are brown, is it true that some dogs are brown? Well, no, right? Uh, that, that can't be true, right? So, uh, in fact, if it's true that no dogs are brown, it's false that some dogs are brown. Uh, so in this case, actually, the first is contrary to the, uh, the second. Uh, if no dogs are brown, is it true that all dogs are brown? Again, no, right? Again, no. In fact, these, you know, these are contrary <laughs> to, each, uh, to each other. Uh, some brown animals are dogs, right? Well, if no, if it's false, I'm sorry, if it's true that no dogs are brown, if it's true that no, you know, we have all the dogs and none of them are brown, well, this one says, well, some brown animals are actually dogs. Well, no, right? that, that's also false. The first three are actually each contrary. Uh, the, you know, the, the three options are each contrary to the proposition. Well, you know, by process of elimination, we figured out the last one is actually sufficient. Uh, the, you know, the, the last proposition is what we're looking for. Um, you know, the first, the given proposition is sufficient for you know, this one here. But it's still helpful to go through the reasoning. So on the assumption that no dogs are brown, let's say that's true, uh, is it true that some dogs uh, are not brown? Well, yeah. Right, that, that's the idea. You know, we have you know, we have these dogs, none of them are brown. Uh, so at least some of those dogs are not brown. Right? Now, you know, don't be fooled by the conversational you know convention that we have. When we say, well, some things are not this, therefore some things are. Well, that's not true, right? So you know, uh, some dogs are um, are not bright yellow, right? <laughs> or uh, uh, well, that doesn't mean that some dogs are bright yellow, and. Right? That, that inference doesn't work. That's just a convention that we have. It's, maybe we've got to drop that convention. Okay, so there's three kinds of problems that we have for this uh, uh, chapter. Um, that's it for these kind of sample problems. Um, good luck. Okay, well, that's all I got for now. Uh, we've taken a look at atomic propositions and the four simple truth relations that exist between them, that can exist between them. We've also got irrelevancy, but that's not really a relation. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've even looked at some exercises. Uh, good luck uh, working on those exercises. Uh, I'll see you in the next chapter. Keep thinking. <laughs>